Welcome back, everyone. I'm Adam Okada, and I don't know about you, but today has absolutely flown by. What an incredible way to kick off our weekend. We've heard from some dynamic speakers today. I know I learned a lot, and we've saved a great topic for last. So I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage some exceptional industry educators. First, I'd like to reintroduce Michael Matthews. He is the Director of Clinical Education and Training for Agility. Teaming up for Mike for this session, I would like to welcome back Nancy Chobin. If you missed our earlier introduction, Nancy Chobin is the president and CEO of Sterile Processing University. She is a consultant on a mission to provide sterile processing departments with the skills and knowledge to be successful. And joining for this conversation is also Melissa Benedict, Melin or Melinda Benedict, I'm sorry. Melinda is the global senior manager of infection prevention at Olympus Corporation. She is board certified in infection, infection control and has an extensive background in laboratory management and clinical science. Belinda is also a certified flexible endoscope reprocessor and is an active member of several AMI committees where she helps develop industry standards for endoscope and medical device reprocessing. So get ready to join this trio for an all hands on deck discussion about the future of endoscopy reprocessing training and education. Leading this discussion will be myself and uh, this session is dedicated to you guys out there, the clean freaks. So please join us in welcoming in Mike, Nancy and Melinda. Welcome in, everybody. Great. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank All you. Right. And I think I'm going to start because we're going to go through the past, present, and future of endoscopy training and education. So I'm going to start out with Nancy. Let, let's talk about the training and education of HLDs. What did that look like in the past? <laughs> well, there wasn't much. I call it incestuous training. Mary learned from Beulah, who learned from Claire, who learned from someone else 30 years ago and we were doing the same thing. There were no policies, no procedures, no guidelines. We just won we just winged it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that that was uh, a lot of us were just kind of thrown into the fire, right? You just go into the department, you follow somebody and then they're like you're on your own. You figure it out. I worked on night shift where I was pretty much by myself figuring it out. Uh, Mike, yeah. has that been your experience in the past too? Yeah, and of course, you know, the flexible scope piece was actually newer for me as a as a technician. Uh, I did a lot of my stuff primarily in uh, the OR first, uh, but you're right. Yeah, like it was you learn from whomever your trainer was, and usually the trainer was just who happened to be there, uh, you know, the longest. And as we all know, just because you've been doing a job a long time doesn't necessarily mean you're good at it. It just means you're good enough not to get fired. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it is, it's, it, it becomes kind of like the phone game and everybody knows how the phone game works. You know, you start at one end you relay information by the end of the phone game, you've got something totally different and bad information tends to proliferate in that type of environment. And so, yeah, it was kind of the wild west. And of course, uh, like all situations, there were people who were genuinely good and passionate about it, but there was a whole lot of bad stuff out there too. Yes, Absolutely. Uh, Nancy, can you talk a little bit about the gaps and what the results were of that old approach, that kind of throwing people into the fire, what happened? Well, in all honesty, we really didn't know because we only knew what they knew. Again, there were no standards. There were no guidelines. I remember uh, 40 years ago when I started at my own hospital and there was someone that um, actually had to uh, leave her job because she was reprocessing or high-level disinfecting the endoscopes in a patient closet. Now, what they did was, this was you know, a long time ago, uh, they took a patient room and they converted it to an endoscopy room. And uh, there was a little closet where, you know, they put the patient clothes. And, and uh, that's where she was doing the high-level disinfection. And she inhaled all of these fumes and wound up with severe ulcerations in her nasal mucosa and had to leave the job. And, you know, none of us even knew about the severity of the chemicals that we were using. There were no standards for the chemicals or the scopes. So um, it, it, it was a challenging time. I, I can kind of compare it to the ethylene oxide that we had in hospitals. We were all using it. None of us knew it could kill us. You know, it wasn't until 1984 when the first OSHA standard came out. So we learned through the years. Unfortunately, sometimes it, something happens, and that's when we start learning. Uh, but um, none of us really knew how much was wrong because there was nothing to really bring us 
to a point where we found out that it was wrong. It was only maybe about, in my opinion, 20 years ago that we really started to see an emphasis where the procedures became, I call it the Katie Couric effect. You know, once she went on television and explained how important colonoscopies were, uh, then there was a lot of attention to these procedures, and, and patients became educated and were asking. There's actually an article I remember distinctly that the FDA put in the newspaper and said, if you're having this procedure, these are the questions you have to ask. So uh, people started becoming more informed, and that's what really drove this whole thing to get better training and education. Yes, absolutely right. I think I think prior to that, um, you know, it's it's the knowledge. People need that knowledge base, and once they know things, then it's you're able to like, oh, maybe we need to research this. Maybe we need to know better. Same thing with the chemicals, like you mentioned. Like we were exposed to OPA and all these other things, but nobody really talked about it. And then finally, they did studies and said, hey, this is dangerous. We should not have people around this all the time, you know, inhaling these fumes. So now there's regulations surrounding it. But it's the knowledge first, right? The data always needs to come first. Um, Mike, how were endo reprocessing technicians viewed and treated by the industry and or uh, people within the hospital? Yeah, I mean, like this is basically a, a dishwasher with a very specialized, you know, dishwashing machine, right? And, uh, and then we still hear that. And, and if you if you really want to, you know, see a, a reprocessing t technician cringe, you know, that's that's how you you get under their skin real quick is you make that comparison and uh you know that that's just not the case i mean i don't know how you clean dishes but my dishes don't take 130 steps to be executed perfectly in order with any variation of one of those steps invalidating the other 129 steps like that's not dishwashing that's an incredibly technical skill and uh, you know again like the they just were not given that that uh, attention they were not hired for that skill that that skill level and they certainly, uh, you know, and we're still struggling with this, being compensated in that skill level. Exactly right. I mean, it's, and I think also it was also the industry, you know, having regulations and joint commission coming in and shutting hospitals down for not doing this correctly. I think that also added to the, um, you know, us being treated as, oh, this is a really important position. Maybe we need to invest some resources yeah. in doing this correctly. Because uh, before that, it, they were fine with just not giving us any scopes, not giving us any resources. And obviously, it becomes a lot more challenging to turn those scopes over. Um, so let's turn mm -hmm. it over to Melinda. So Melinda, what are the some of the most beneficial recent changes to HLD training and education? Let's bring it into the present now. Uh, what do you think has been the most beneficial recent change? I mean, I think recently in the past year, um, I think one of the few benefits of the COVID pandemic is you saw this big surge of, you know, virtual trainings and on-demand trainings, because I know I work for Olympus and we were very much um, focused on live in-person training and we still are, we still have field employees that, you know, have a, a defined territory and are available for face-to-face -face learning. Um, but I think in the last year, year and a half, it, it's kind of forced industry, including us, to really switch because we that that was taken away. The ability to do face-to-face -face education and training was really taken away. So what we did is we put um, a lot of our previously kind of live in-person uh, training CE courses on demand, and we actually uh, launched a new education website. And so I think that really has been the most beneficial. I think one of the things we always saw previously people struggle with is when we did the live courses, usually you would have the manager showing up because those were the people that had the time to go to the live courses. And then you would have to, you know, trust them to disseminate the information down to the technicians. But now, especially if the courses are on demand, now we have a lot more technicians able to, to take the time and view these education modules directly, which I think is um, really valuable. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mike, I'm going to direct this question to you. How do you feel like recent updated guidelines have impacted how HLD technicians view their responsibility to pursue continuing education? Well, yeah. So, I mean, the the one that we can really think about is ST91. And if you're newer to the industry, you may not realize that ST91 is like a brand spanking new document. Like it is very fresh. And uh, 
they uh, they told us that as soon as the first edition of ST91 was released, they immediately began working on the revision of it, which is going to be released this year. So we're we're pushing towards uh, already our second, you know, kind of not true edition, but I guess it's really an addendum to it uh, that's going to be coming. But uh, the point is, is that like this is fresh, like this is really new in terms of standards. And uh, the standards tend to lag behind industry practice uh, because it takes time to vet standards and really decide what is best practice. But what you will find is, is that just the simple fact that ST91 came out kind of moved flexible endoscope reprocessing from sort of being this like appendage to sterile processing to saying, OK, this is a distinct separate practice that requires you know distinct separate training and distinct separate uh, standards that go along with that. So it's really just kind of recognizing that. You know, when it comes to stainless steel reprocessing and flexible scope reprocessing, you know, these two things are, are there may be a, a few similarities, but they are not the same thing. Yeah, and that's a good point about the regulations and how they're different, um, because I think for a long time, SPD just did the endoscopes or, or some SPDs did, I'm sure, um, but they just process them like they would everything else. And there are so many extra steps, so many, uh, you know, mm -hmm. scope specific things that are unique to HLD. I'm a big proponent of actually separating those two departments and having mm -hmm. a separate uh, set of uh, staff clean those scopes. Um, you know, similar to the way that Frank has his department where his, it's an HLD department, just reprocessing mm -hmm. those devices. Uh, Nancy, uh, can you discuss the new opportunities for learning and education that are available to uh, people in uh, the department today? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have many, many companies. Um, Melinda's already talked about Olympus, but we have many companies that uh, provide continuing education. You can sign up on their website, uh, the chemical manufacturers, uh, the uh, manufacturers who have cleaning efficacy testing uh, tools, uh, you know, the uh, equipment to make sure the leak tester is working. And these are all uh, educational opportunities that uh, really bring the technician to the uh, current standards that we have out there. Um, one thing that's really important to understand, um, Amy's standards are national standards. And they are accepted in a court of law because they're done by um, a peer review panel. Uh, they have a public comment. There's input from every single uh, individual and profession has the ability to comment on them, and that's why they're held in such high regard. That's not saying that you know other stuff out there isn't good, but we have representation from AORN, from SGNA, uh, from infection prevention. So um, these documents are really important, and this update to SG91 is really going to bring us to the next century, in my opinion. Uh, there are many, many things that were learned during the updating of this document. Uh, everything is uh, based on science and peer-reviewed information uh, to justify why we have to do things the way we do. So I project there's going to be a lot of, of, of webinars on exactly what's in SP91 once it gets published because uh, I don't even know if you could do it in just one session. Uh, there's going to be so much information in there. Uh, but there are many opportunities there now. Um, facilities have opened up now. Yeah, you still have to wear a mask if you go in, but uh, people are going in to do in-servicing. And I, I think there is a benefit. Um, you know, I myself, like a lot of other speakers, you know, had to go to uh, webinars. And people did say it was great, uh, but they do like, you know, the camaraderie when they can speak to people during breaks and uh, I always found out, you know, when my staff went to a webinar and they come back and they say, boy, we thought we had it bad here. I talked to some people and they're doing A, B, and C. So <laughs> they sometimes like to get out just to see what other people are doing. But uh, I think today there are many, many more 
opportunities for education where you don't even have to leave the building. Either someone will come in or they're online and you could do them. Now, it would be nice if they got the time to do it because in most facilities, they make time for the uh, nursing staff to have in services at a certain time every day. Uh, but even if you, you couldn't stop all the processing, if you gave you know, each individual so much time each week to do, say, a particular in-service so that they can get it. I think we really have to do that because there are so many changes that are be coming down the road. Uh, people are going to have to have this education. You know, if I had a nickel for every time I heard we don't have time to do the education today, um, you know, I'd be a rich man because that's, that's so many departments are so skeleton staffed that, you know, they really can't. If they if they stop processing for 30 minutes or half the staff for 30 minutes, everything shuts down. They just start losing, uh, you know, they're not able to hit turnover times. And that's really unfortunate. And really, it should be made a priority because uh, our industry is so information intense. There's so much data. There's so much information. And like we were talking about, uh, the ST91, when that update does come out, you're right. There have been a lot of changes. There's a lot of updates. And there's going to be a lot of new things that people need to know about because surveyors are going to know them. Surveyors are going to be very up to date on the changes to ST91. Uh, so you, your department needs to be up to date as well. So definitely, once that document comes out, uh, be on the lookout for those changes. Uh, Melinda, I'm going to bring it yeah. back to you with the uh, the new forms of industry education. What is Olympus doing um, that's maybe new or different uh, to bring education or information to users in the department? Yeah, I think one thing we really try to do is, you know, we're a large corporation and we get a lot of customer feedback and, and trying to um, really consolidate that customer feedback to understand where the root of the questions are coming from and how we can kind of turn that around to offer education. Like, I like to say, if I get the same type of question from a VA in Washington State as I get from a community hospital in Michigan, as I get from a teaching hospital in Georgia, then something is going on there. It's not just a one-off question. It's really probably a widespread um, kind of confusion or question going on. And so we, we try to take that feedback and figure out how to offer education to customers. And we use a variety of different methods. Webinars, again, like we have been talking about becoming increasingly more popular, um, but also we try when we go out to conferences um, to try to do in-boost CE credits or lectures. Um, we do posters. We also, if anybody here is an Olympus customer, you probably have the Olympus wall charts hanging on your wall in the reprocessing area. So we really try to listen to customers, not only to find out what they want more information on, but also how best to deliver that information so it actually gets out to the right people and is useful. Yes, absolutely. And the wall charts are very helpful, by the way. Those are uh, incredibly helpful. I know when I was running an HLD, uh, we had the wall charts pretty much all over the walls. Like every vendor has a kind of a wall chart and it was, yeah. they were everywhere. Um, Mike, what are some of the hot topics in endo reprocessing today that will have implications on where the industry goes tomorrow? Well, you know, if you listen to my earlier talks, you know that we talked about damage and cost. Uh, and I do believe that this is probably one of the biggest areas where we see, uh, you know, shifts in the future because these devices are getting more and more complex. They're not getting simpler. And as they get more complex, they're getting uh, more expensive and therefore, uh, you know, the repair costs are going up as well. And so I, I think that that emphasis on helping uh, customers demonstrate a return on investment for that education and improving their practices is really probably where we're where we're going to see the the biggest shift because i really think that we are going to see uh, kind of a, a shift away from the generalized educational in-service to very i would almost call them micro in-services where, okay, you can't give us a full hour, but can you give us 15 minutes to talk about one thing, just one little aspect? And that one little aspect may not even be CE approved because it's too small, but it's designed to answer a specific problem that's going on in your department you know, right now. So it may be on leak testing or it may be on the angulation system or you know whatever. But the point is, is that having 
data that tells you where your process is breaking down and then having education that speaks specifically to that point and that point alone is going to be probably one of the largest shifts. It's, it's, it's a shift from these larger, broad presentations to micro education. It's, it's, you know, it's the difference between a, a shotgun and a rifle approach, right? <laughs> there you go. Good. It's an excellent analogy for sure. Um, Nancy, how about you? Uh, hot topics in endoscopy reprocessing um, that may have implications on where the industry goes in the future? Well, uh, again, I, you know, we're seeing single use scopes come into play. Uh, we're seeing some scopes that can be steam sterilized. My opinion, uh, I don't really see a big future for these. Um, I think the endoscopists really prefer to have, you know, the equipment they have now. I, uh, you know, uh, I can't base that on anything, but from what I've seen in my 40 plus years in the profession, uh, they don't really look at the disposables that, that that they work as well as something that's reusable and has a lot of bells and whistles on it that they can control their environment. So, um, but there will be an impact there. You know, people do decide to go with these. Uh, devices, how to um, handle them and how to use them. Uh, that would certainly be in the endoscopy suite. Um, I think that we're going to see uh, a lot more on documentation uh, because, again, you know, litigation is through the roof. And um, because, you know, there was so much emphasis on COVID and, um, you know, now people are coming back to reality. And what I'm really worried about is when we do get all of these new uh, recommendations from ST91, if people don't have enough staff or equipment now, what are they going to do when this document comes out? Uh, you know, you can't decide you're not going to follow it because then you're going to put your facility at risk because you're not complying with national standards. And um, I think the time has come where we really need to take a hard look at the amount of time it takes to reprocess scopes, especially the cleaning protocols. Uh, in my opinion, I think every scope should be checked for cleanliness before it's high level disinfected, but that's just me. Um, I've had probably over 30 uh, colonoscopies because I was uh, someone who was diagnosed very early about uh, 20 years ago with a malignant polyp. And so I did have some surgery, and fortunately, I didn't need any follow-up treatment, so I feel very indebted to this profession. Um, and uh, I made sure when I went to my endoscopist, I looked at how he was processing them, and we, we chat all the time. Uh, you know, when I was just had another uh, colonoscopy in April, and uh, he was saying, well, what's new? And I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> so, uh, but I think we're, we're really going to have to work on this week. You know, it, it's better in sterile processing, not perfect. I think uh, some of the tools that we have with productivity and staffing have helped people get the amount of staffing they need. But we really need to focus on the education, not only of the staff, but management. They need to understand that you can't keep doing things the way you did them. We've always done it that way. The things have changed. We have to change with them. We need the staff. We need the equipment in order to get the job done. And and we just can't play this game anymore. Um, it, it's very serious what can happen to a patient. And um, I, I know for a fact that many of these never make the news. They're settled out of court, and nobody wants to know anything. And that's all well and good. Uh, but, you know, a patient at some point had some kind of a untoward effect, and it wasn't even – the patient's fault. It wasn't even the endoscopy process's fault. Uh, it was the facility's fault because they did not provide the staffing and the equipment and the training that they needed. So I'm hoping that this document is really going to drive this and force that issue. Yeah, that would be my hope as well. And and you're absolutely right on not seeing those things in print, right? I mean, the, the stories that we see seem to come out like once a week, or sometimes even more than that, it feels like, where there's something an adverse effect from some kind of instrument or reprocessing or, or scope. And, you know, if you look at the MOD database, it's well beyond that. It's it's the number of incidents that happen uh, goes well beyond what we see in the news. So you're absolutely yeah. right there. And, and can I just kind of piggyback on that is I think there's a, a significant number of uh, adverse outcomes that just kind of get written off as, well, these are just normal complications, right? 
you know that when you go in for a procedure, that infection is just part of the risk. And so uh, when a hospital has an infection, they either bury it or they treat it with antibiotics and never report it. Or, you know, as long as they're beho- below a certain threshold, like half a percent, they say, okay, we're hitting our numbers, so don't worry about it, right? And, uh, you know, so it, it, it co- becomes kind of like this really sick numbers game where as long as you're not above a certain percentage, the infections just don't matter. And, you know, that that's a that's a that sounds great until you're in that half a percent, right, that gets the infection or it's your loved one. And that's not OK. Right. So I, I think a lot uh, there is far, far more adverse events and infections that go on that just don't get reported or ignored or just passed over. Right. You're absolutely well, correct. You- yeah. I mean, if you think about the number of procedures that are done in the U.S. every year, uh, half a percent is huge. I mean, it could be mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of people. So, I mean, we're not talking about small numbers of procedures. We're talking about a lot of people that get injured or sick or pass away because of things that happen in the reprocessing. Uh, again, where, you know, and like Nancy said, you know, a lot of times it's not these techs. It's the the facility that didn't give them the, the information, didn't give them the resources, didn't give them the tools to do them correctly. I am yeah, curious to hear Melinda's. Being, we call uh, that being set up for failure. Set up for failure, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to hear Melinda's take on the uh, disposable. We kind of touched on that a little bit, but the disposable scopes and equipment that we see in the department today, what is your feeling on uh, where that might go in the future? Yeah, I think it could go a couple different ways, but I tend to kind of lean um, the same way Nancy goes is, you know, we hear we hear different opinions on um, the disposables. I think in general, the disposable accessories, disposable buttons, water bottles, things like that, brushes, obviously, people are really into. It just kind of takes the uh, pain in the neck factor of reprocessing a lot of really small things away. Um but as far as disposable scopes, I think it totally depends on um, what we'll see in the future as far as what physicians end up um, preferring. Because if they, uh, at the end of the day, they need to do the procedure and they need to do it well and they need to do it with a piece of equipment that works for them and is easy to use. And I think that's going to end up really being a deciding factor. Um, I think one thing about single use is that we can't stop pushing forward with education and training and making people aware that the reusable products are still perfectly safe to use as long as you reprocess them correctly. Yeah. And Adam, I I think a big piece to that is, you know, uh, by switching to a disposable like that, you're, you're essentially saying we can't manage the process. Right. And so uh, you're just kind of removing the process, but, you know, changing the product is kind of just a bypass for the fact that we didn't do the process right, right? So if the process can be managed properly, you don't need the disposable. And I, I, I'm coming at this mm-hmm. from a sterile processing technician standpoint because, you know, I, that that's my perspective. That's what I came up in. And I always found the concept of disposables to almost be insulting because it's like, it's like you're being told that you can't do the job good enough, right? And so we're just going to cut you out of the picture entirely. And I, I get that. So I, I see it from that perspective. But then I also see it from the patient perspective of saying, all right, what would I rather have used on me if I don't know that this sterile processing or this endoscopy reprocessing department is reliable or not? Because I don't know if they're reliable or not. What would I want? And so I'm really torn on this. Uh, but it seems odd to me that that the the solution to not being able to to manage the process is to remove the product or change the product itself. When why not just uh, why not just address the root cause, the process? I, I yes, agree absolutely. That, that there's an elephant in the room that we have to discuss, and and that is, um, you know, the um, Dr. Ritala and. Uh, many other people uh, are are really pushing that all uh, GI endoscopes, both upper, lower, in addition to ERCPs and what have you, should be sterilized. And we know that, you know, it's going to take time for companies to uh, redo their scopes and come up with new ways. That, but this means that in addition to everything else, these facilities eventually are going to have to phase out their automated endoscope reprocessors 
and go to sterilization. And and this is a whole new ball game for them. And um, to be honest with you, I understand the concept, but I really felt that the upper and lower GI scopes should be left with um, high-level disinfection. Um, I think the all the other scopes, urological scopes, bronchoscopes, should all be sterile. And um, but to to include the other scopes. And simply by saying, by sterilizing, we're going to make them more safe, it goes against everything we've learned in, in sterilization. If it's not clean, you can't disinfect or sterilize it. So I'm having trouble with understanding how if something wasn't properly clean, that sterilization is going to compensate for that. Um, but, you know, it's a done deal. Um, you know, it, it's going to take time for that to get changed, but we, we're going to have to understand that this is, uh, you know, going to be creeping into our practice, and it's going to be another major, major change. Yes, it will be. And I, I was on that ST91 meeting, and I remember we had several hours of a, um, I, wanna, I don't want to call it an argument. I want to say it was a heated, it was a lively discussion about uh, okay. sterilization of these endoscopes. And, and you're right that, I mean, all of us that were in the industry were saying like, look, we understand that sterilization is better, but it's not, it's not the high level disinfection part that's lacking. It's most often the cleaning. It's most often that we don't have the tools, the resources to clean them correctly. We don't have the time to clean them correctly. And then it's, the sterilization is not going to matter because the cleaning step is getting missed. It's getting skipped or it's getting um, overlooked. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that it's it's the cleaning step uh, that's the most important thing. And when we're talking about endoscopes or anything in this arena, um, that's that's the most important thing that I want people to focus on. It's always always going to be that cleaning step. Um, yeah, I let's mean, see. I, we did. I would have been happy. I would have been happy if they just mandated that every scope had to be checked for cleanliness. I mean, you know, for the small cost of doing that. Uh, that would give you um, some level of, uh, you know, security, but water under the bridge. <laughs> exactly. I don't, not to extend the conversation, but I think, you know, it, this is something that really has to be done carefully. I think something to keep in mind is sustainable health care and, and access to health care. And what is the trickle down effect from switching from a high level disinfection based process to sterilization considering endoscopes um the the, the materials they're made out of really um you know they, they don't hold up as well to sterilization sterilization is a more harsh process and, and what is and the turnaround time you're gonna have to places are gonna have to buy more devices to keep up with that but what how is the patient affected you know somebody has to pay for that Who's going to end up paying for it? And we really want to avoid, you know, there has to be a risk and benefit, um, you know, analysis there done because if the trickle down effect is that the access to a screening colonoscopy becomes more difficult to obtain for a patient or more expensive for a patient, then we have less people going for screening colonoscopies. And really, what does that mean for public health? So it's yes. a very large and complicated uh, discussion. Yeah. And I mean, again, like I know we're kind of dragging this out, but I, I think it creates a very good point about a lot of the, the aspects related to this discussion. And I, I, Adam, I think your your point earlier is very well made that if the, the, the problem is not with the concept of high level disinfection, if a scope is properly manually cleaned and then high level disinfected, that scope is safe for patient care. Right. The problem is not the high level disinfection step. It's the fact that we can't get it clean leading up to the high level disinfection. Right. So, again, it's like we're looking for these quick fix solutions like just move to disposable, just move to sterilization, because those are easier fixes than fix the process. The cleaning process is the problem. So and I know that's harder to fix because it's not just buy this or just change this. It's a whole series of things that have to be adjusted. And that's a longer ask. That's a bigger ask. That's a more complex ask. But that is the solution. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for anybody that missed uh, Frank Daniels uh, talk earlier today with Hank Balch, um, you know, he uh, Frank runs an HLD. 
and his HLD, they have like time limits on the, based on the instructions for use. This is how long it takes to do these scopes. And based on that data, then he said, this is how many technicians it's going to take to do the number of scopes that you're asking us to do. But it's that data step, right? I mean, we need to know to do this properly. We need this amount of staff. And a lot of times, we, you know, staff is just winging it. You know, we know that we're not getting enough time. We know that we have to turn these things over because the doctors are breathing down our necks to get them turned. Uh, but really, it's about having enough time, enough resources mm -hmm. to get these th things done correctly. Um, so let's move on. We're, we're starting to run out of time here, but let's move on to the future of endoscope reprocessing. I think a lot of people want to know. We kind of know what the situation is now, what the situation was in the past. But let's talk about the future. Um, and I'll start with Nancy. Nancy, uh, what? or actually, I'm going to start with Melinda because this is a manufacturer's question. So Melinda, what greater role can manufacturers play in educating users in the field? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, as manufacturers, usually we are large, usually global companies. Um, we have resources. And I think it is just, um, you know, utilizing our resources, again, to really listen to customer needs on what they want to hear and what they need to hear in order to <clears throat> further their education, answer questions they may be having. And also a lot of what we do now and what, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do into the future is knowing when we are the experts and when we're not the experts. So, for example, um, the endoscope manufacturer, we are the experts on how to clean and reprocess and use the medical devices that we manufacture. We get a lot of questions outside that, that bubble, and it's understanding and knowing when to guide a customer maybe to their guidelines or to OSHA or outside of the, the, the device manufacturer world and, and guide them into where they can get those answers. Um, that being said, we currently and will continue to partner with those professional societies so we can stay really up to date on what's coming up. ST91 has been mentioned a couple times um, in this session and Olympus does participate in ST91. So we know what's coming, so we can prepare ahead of time into the future so that we're able to, when these new, new standards and guidelines come out, help our customers meet some of these newer or more updated recommendations when they come out. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm interested to hear Mike's side of this, too, because as a uh, working for a repair company, um, as Mike has, uh, I think I would think that this has a lot to do with how um, that third party reprocessing comes into play, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the the educational materials and the way that that you partner with your your uh, repair vendor is going to be very critical because uh, again, we kind of come back to that data piece, right? So where are you getting your data from? And uh, one of those critical pieces of data is going to be uh, wh why, why are my devices breaking, right? And so the impetus is on your repair industry then to give you actionable reports that say you had this many breaks, here's what probably caused them, Here's the education that's delivered specifically about those process issues. And so, uh, you know, to Melinda's point earlier about the, the shift to on-demand education, you know, a lot of companies have made that shift too. And Northfield, now Agility is one of them as well. And I would expect that that repair vendor uh, is now really focused on being your partner, helping you save money, and helping you deliver and identify education that's necessary to fix those process problems that are leading to that preventable cost. Yeah, and I, one of the things that you talked about in your talk earlier that uh, I use when I go into facilities all the time is you know, this, this idea of not having enough time leads to more repairs, leads to higher costs, leads to we don't have enough scopes, so now we have to go faster with the scopes we have, which leads to more breaks and more repairs. That it's cycle. this ongoing cycle of like, I don't have enough time, and then everything falls apart, right? So it's just, I, I just wish that people would, would understand that and understand that you just need more time and more resources because these scopes are so delicate, so complex, and so easy to get it wrong, right? That was uh, something Sunil talked about in his talk, which is, you know, the, this, the Joint Commission even recognizes this is a process that's easy to get wrong. 
So we just need the time and the training to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna direct this next one to Nancy. Nancy, how do you think technology will impact the way that HLD technicians are initially trained and then continually educated in the field in the future? I think one way to really ensure that that happens is with certification. Um, I think New Jersey is probably the only state that wrote into our certification bill that anyone reprocessing anything, including scopes, had to be certified. And when you do that, um, you know, they need so many approved continuing education points in order to continue uh, with their certification. Uh, and with that certification comes a salary increase, or at least it should be, according, you know, to, in my opinion. You have someone who has proven that they uh, have a certain level of competency and uh, they've taken that step, uh, which will benefit your facility. And I think there really has to be a push uh, to make sure that this happens. I, um, it, It's unfortunate that the other states other than New Jersey that um, – enacted certification, grandfathered everyone in, and it only started on the day this certification went into effect. Um, I, I don't know why that was done, but well, we only had a three-year lead-in with the blessing of the New Jersey Hospital Association. Um, so it's going to take a long time before a lot of people get certified. But I don't even know if, if uh, endoscopy processing is included in any of those uh, states that already have certification. But uh, with everything coming down the pipe, the training is so important. We have to focus on this. We have to know how much time it takes to process these scopes, whether they're being done manually or they're being done in the AER. Uh, you know, you, you can't put everything into one basket. Uh, we need to know if it's going to take, I, I believe the studies we did uh, with the Amy productivity module was that it was 75 minutes per scope. Um, if it was done all manually, including the high-level disinfection. Uh, but I think with the new procedures where, you know, uh, the documentation that needs to be done uh, well above what was being done now, uh, the testing of the leak tester, uh, making sure that the, um, the scopes are dry, even uh, doing a test to see that they're dry before they go into the cabinet, unless it's a, a drying cabinet. Uh, this is all going to only extend the amount of time and if we don't have the time to do it now, how are we ever going to be able to uh, accommodate all of these new standards, which um, are really needed to protect our patients? So education is, has just have to, has to be from every single uh, opportunity that we have, uh, both from the manufacturers and from uh, the facilities themselves. Um, but a good way to really enforce that, in my opinion, is with certification. I think it should be required for everyone processing these scopes. 100% agree. I mean, I think that it's it goes back to the, the why we do what we do. Yes, you can teach somebody to follow the rules, to follow the instructions for use, teach them the ways to do things, but certification really provides that why we do it. It's, we're doing it to protect against microorganisms, against pathogens, and learning about how those things work, how to kill them, how to stop the chain of infection. Those are all things that certification will do that when you're training in the department, they don't really tell you how to do. Um, so that baseline of knowledge is really important. Um, I'll turn it back over to Mike talking about technology and how do you feel like it's going to impact the way HLD technicians are trained? Yeah. So, I mean, first off, like what we're doing right now is different, right? The, this is the first time we've had a virtual conference that was devoted to uh, completely to flexible scopes ever. And so this alone is an innovation. And we have people from all over the world who are here listening to this. So that alone is an innovation. But while the on-demand resources do become more widely available and more widely dispersed, I do think there is a, a still a great opportunity here for learning things hands on, right? And so as we invest and as we see the technical skills that are required to be able to do this very well, I would not be at all surprised to begin seeing uh, technical schools begin to show up that provide this type of education and hands on training so that somebody can go into a facility already certified. Now, already certified and already prepared to do all of those steps correctly. Now, with that being said, 
there is a chicken and egg situation going there, which is, you know, if you're not paying these people, why would anyone ever go to school to learn how to do it? So, you know, if there's a chicken and egg situation going on here, but the data is probably there. Just nobody's looking for it to validate the fact that a good skilled technician who does their job well saves a facility an inordinate amount of money that well pays for themselves and a significant pay raise too. Absolutely. If you just look at, let's say, OR time, if you if you have poorly trained technicians that are wasting the OR minutes or whatever it is, just ask mm -hmm. any OR manager how, how much a minute of OR time costs. It'll shock you at how much one minute of OR time costs. And if you have well-trained technicians that know what they're doing, that's where you're going to save a bulk of the money because you're not going to have those delays. You're going to have things reprocessed correctly, uh, you know, pretty much every time. Uh, there yep. has to be some room for human error. But again, that, yeah, you're absolutely right. The training aspect, getting these well-trained technicians into the departments that have certification, advanced certification, those really high performers, that's how you keep a department running and running effectively. Yeah, not um, just those all wanna... OR minutes. Yeah, not just those OR minutes, but prevented repairs or repairs that are identified early rather than catastrophic and the infections, right? You know, it's like those are three major money makers and your reprocessing technicians touch all three of them. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm interested also hear uh, Melinda's take on the future or technology uh, in the way that in, uh, technicians are trained in the endoscopy department. Yeah, I totally agree with Mike. I really see this as something very similar to like, um, you know, a, a massage therapy certification or a medical assistant program, you know, something that community college or tech schools will offer maybe a three, six, nine, one year certification. And so it's not fully being trained on the job and, and not to go back to about 45 minutes ago, but you know, that I think will really help that phenomenon um, that Nancy was talking about of, you know, people just getting trained by maybe more senior staff members. And we see this a lot that, you know, people who started in the field 10, 20, 30 years ago are still doing what they learned back then and are teaching their junior, um, you know, coworkers the same thing. And nobody, I would like to think, nobody in this industry does things wrong or misses steps on purpose. Everybody always thinks they're doing it 100% correctly. But um, I really think kind of really putting an emphasis on certification, on training, on creating programs so that people can enter the job already trained can also help kind of combat that phenomenon as well. But yeah, I really see, see certification and really overall the industry understanding needs to be that these are skilled very technically oriented jobs and people need to get paid because they are doing skilled and very technical jobs exactly right um i'm curious to hear you guys' thoughts on this and uh, you know we were talking about the the future of endoscope reprocessing things like that uh do you guys have you guys heard anything about vr or virtual reality um, training programs. I've heard a little bit about this in, in the sterile processing space, but I really feel it's specifically in endoscope reprocessing, that VR training could be really invaluable at teaching the steps um, in a controlled environment where they're not going to harm somebody if they do it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't heard anything specifically about that yet, but I do think that if you were to really, you know, be creative and think about where where we could go, then yes, like there, I, I think there is an opportunity here. Now, again, there's kind of a chicken and egg situation going on where, okay, so why would somebody offer virtual reality training if nobody has virtual reality headsets who wants to go to school on them, right? But, yeah. but that being said, when you think about the possibilities where there could be a school or a manufacturer or, you know, a couple manufacturers who, who, who offer this service and they get those technicians to have hands-on training that isn't actually requiring them to go to some place or attend some place. They can do that in their home, get that training, and then go in, then therefore then go into a facility already prepared with the knowledge and skills on what to do. So I, I think it's interesting. Will it play out that way? Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I, exactly. I, I think um, one of the things that, and, and I know that, you know, there are people that don't have access to any training at all, and, and some kind of training is better than none, but um, even the FDA and their recommendations says that hands-on training is the best way to do it because you could touch it, you could feel it, you could look at it, say, oh, you know, this is here, this is there. It just has a better outcome. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure as this moves forward, because there's all kinds of sterile processing and surgical technician schools, uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing something uh, with endoscopy as well. But um, you have to be careful because sometimes uh, I have had people who came from schools where these poor techs paid a lot of money, um, uh, you know, close to $20,000 for a hands-on course and then a clinical time in a facility. And um, they really were not doing the best practices. They weren't given the most up-to-date information. They were given whatever information that particular company was using. Um, and um, so you still have to, when someone comes into your facility, my advice is do a competency assessment on them to make sure that they have been trained correctly before you just assume and put them into um, into the process because I, I had another case where a young lady was working at an endoscopy center and decided to leave and go to another center because it was closer to her home. And uh, when she went there, she told them what kind of processor she was using, and they said, well, we have a different one. Well, long story short, they said they trained her. There was just one sheet of paper that said, you know, the name of the automated endoscope reprocessor. Three months later, they had two machines um, a, a service rep was in servicing one of the machines, and he said, wait a minute, did you just take that scope out? And she said, yes. He said, well, I've only been here 10 minutes. It should take longer than that. He said, no, that's how long it takes all the time. So he went over to look. She was only using the wash cycle. And she said that's what she was told to do, and that's what she did. They had no documentation that anyone showed her anything else, and they had to go back and and recall, notify patients for the whole three months she had been working there. So just because someone comes in and says that, you know, I've been burned too many times, I do a competency assessment. If they don't do things the way they should be done, then we'll train them. But at least we've identified any of those issues. Yeah. And I mean, I, I teach certification classes myself, and I notice the difference being online right now to when I was doing it in person. In person, there's a lot more like I can physically show you an instrument, show you inspection points on an instrument. And endoscopes is even more that way, right? You really need to understand where are these channels, what channels, you know, where's the instrument port, where's the suction port, where, you know, where are the all of these things that are on an endoscope that are just very difficult to understand um, unless you have it in your hand, unless you can see it and feel it. So you're right on the, the hands-on part of that. Um, uh, so let's move back to Melinda here. Um, as equipment continues to become more complex or sometimes even disposable, how will that change the way HLD technicians contribute to patient care in their roles? Is that role going to change based on the future of uh, what this technology does? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of similar to the, the VR discussion. I see the possibility of AI kind of making um, its way into reprocessing. I think um, we've already, there's there's a couple facilities that I have been in who, and, and I forget what the name is, they use a um, kind of retrospective virtual video platform where a third party will actually you know, watch the technician reprocess a scope and has to sign off on it before it's allowed to be released. Um, but I think as kind of that technology moves on and the equipment itself becomes more complex, I think, again, it just all will always go back to the fact that these people are doing very technically oriented jobs, whether it's the device that they are cleaning and reprocessing is technical and complex in itself or the equipment, the VR, the AI, whatever they're using in order to clean it. And it's also very technical and complex. So, you know, I think, I hope we see an increased um, appreciation in the industry for the job that, that reprocessing technicians actually do in order to protect patient safety and really keep the hospitals and the clinics moving. Yep, absolutely. And that's an excellent point too. Um, so, Mike, um, what skill sets do you think technicians are going to need or use in the future to adapt to the complexity and the, the changing nature of endoscopy? Yeah, so uh, it, 
I really think that particularly those who are in leadership are going to have to learn some form of data analytics. Uh, and I know that's kind of a big, scary word, but think about how many times we've used the word data in this conference. I mean, we're probably into the dozens at this point, right? Uh, there's a reason for that, uh, you know, that, that data is objective and you can make th better decisions based on your data. But if you don't know the first thing about data and how to look at it and how to interpret it and how to turn it into actionable information, you know, that, then it's just numbers. Like it doesn't help you, right? And so especially for those who are in leadership, probably one of the biggest training pieces that needs to be added to that repertoire is data analytics. Like, what do I do with this information? How do I gather information? How am I sure that I'm gathering good information? You know, and, and then what do I actually do with it once I've got it? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> the data is useless unless you have a way to put it into actionable steps to do something with it, right? It's, it's and I, you know, one thing Sunil said that I really wanted to kind of, uh, I wish I had a chance to like talk to him directly about it because I felt like it was an excellent point. Uh, every hospital I've ever gone into says they're doing the right thing. But the thing you need to do for the, the regulatory bodies is you need to show me that you're doing the right thing. You can't just say, you know, we do this process. Yes, we test this thing. If you don't have the data, if you don't have the reports, the, you know, yep. the actual yep. documents or the digital files that say you're doing it, it doesn't matter to regu the, the regulatory bodies, right? It's, it's the data that is required. So yes, data, data analytics is probably going to be a much bigger part of this. And we're running out of time. So I wanted to get to this last question. I'll start with, uh, uh, Nancy on this one. So Nancy, do you think we'll continue to see the roles of certified sterile processing technicians and certified endo techs? Or do you think they're going to become more specialized, separated, more together? Um, how do you feel like that training is going to go in the future? Well, I, it depends on the facility. You know, if you're in a very small critical access hospital, they're probably doing everything because um, it's a small facility and, uh, you know, you don't want to have duplication of services. Uh, in other facilities, um, larger teaching facilities, you know, a thousand beds, uh, you might have multiple departments that are doing uh, the processing. But I think regardless of who's doing it, they need to have certification. We need to have a level playing field there. There has to be a recognition of the importance of this job with salary recognition commensurate with the responsibility for the job. It's the same thing with sterile processing. We still have people in sterile processing who are making less than minimum wage. You know, and they base it on, well, we did a study of all the local hospitals. Well, I don't care what the other hospitals are doing. <laughs> they might not be doing it right. If we have certified people, they're mean more, they are worth more to us. And, and we need to pay them. We don't want them to leave and go to another facility. I've done two studies on the cost of training a sterile processing worker. And it was 1988, uh, no, 1998 and 2008. And um, it was in 2008, the cost had gone to well over $50,000. And that doesn't include re recruitment, uh, putting ads in the paper, uh, doing the uh, physicals, doing the security background checks and what have you. And uh, we actually did a white paper for administration and said, we have lost this many people because other facilities are paying more. When we multiplied how many people times uh, what it was costing us to train them, it came to over half a million dollars. And we were able to give everyone in our system a raise. Some people actually got $6 an hour. That's how low they were being paid. And um, it was one way to effectively get it done. We, we've got to do it. We can't allow people to stonewall this. We've got to keep bringing it up and bringing it up. It has to get done. Yep, exactly right. I mean, if you, uh, to use a sports analogy, I know sometimes people hate sports analogies, but if you're, you're paying technicians and you're the Pittsburgh Pirates, right, and you have a really low payroll, you're probably not going to go to the playoffs very often because you have low-performing technicians, and once they get good at the, their job, they're going to go play for the Yankees that are going to pay them a lot more, right? I mean, and that's just the nature of the business. So, yes, paying your technicians what they're worth is absolutely an important part. And just think about the money of one surgical site infection. Um, if you can prevent that by having good certified technicians in your department, you've saved the hospital millions of dollars. I mean, just that one decision to pay them better. 
And it doesn't cost very much to pay SPD technicians what they're worth, but in the long run, it will save the hospital lots of money. So let's go on. We do have, uh, well, we're running out of time, but let's do at least one question here. Um, let's see. I want to I get a good one here for everybody. Um, let's see. Do you guys think there's a pay scale on the horizon that reflects the importance of the job? Um, like, do you see that there's hospitals that are understanding this and that are starting to recognize this now? I guess I'll start with Mike. Uh, yeah, actually, I have been to a few facilities where they do this. And of course, Nancy just referenced one, you know, that she worked with. And by the way, I have referenced Nancy's article on what does a what does it cost to retrain a, uh, a, a sterile processing or to train a sterile processing technician multiple times uh, throughout my career. And I go back to that one frequently. You know, if you've got that kind of data you can make that kind of return on investment argument, right? And so again, it goes back to the data analytics. Like what what do you want to do? Make that business case. The the data's there. You just gotta use it. Absolutely. And Nancy, I'm Nancy, I've used that document as well. And also I think you did one on the loaners, the cost of reprocessing a loaner tray. I've also used that yeah. to give my technicians a pay bump as well. So you've done so much research in this area and really has has been to the benefit of i think a lot of people in the industry so we all owe you a thank you for that um let's see let's see let's do one more here um i'll direct this to melinda as an spd and soon to be scope reprocessing instructor at a technical school what do you all see as the biggest hindrance for students coming out of school and into the workforce in the future so included students who pass their certification what do you think is the biggest hindrance for them getting into the industry Oh, I wouldn't call it a hindrance as much as um, just having to adapt to the environment. But I think I see, you know, it's part of my job. I, I go into reprocessing areas and GI specifically reprocessing areas. And they are vastly different from facility to facility, really depending on who oversees them. So I think it depends on kind of what that person's first job is. Is it, like Nancy said, is it in a very small facility where there's one or two people on at a time expected to do everything and the pace is nuts and crazy and there's a thousand things going on at once? Or are they going to a really big academic center where there's a lot more staff, things are very much more regimented and structured, um, where it's still very busy, but you know there is more of a, of a expectation of what your day is going to look like every day. So, you know, I think that background um, technical school experience is incredibly valuable. It's just kind of how we all struggle when we get our first jobs, especially or even a new job. It's just acclimating to the environment you happen to end up in. That's true. Nancy, do you have thoughts on that one? Uh, as technicians are coming out of school and getting certified and into the workforce, do you see any hindrance or roadblocks for them as they get in? Well, they may run into, again, they're going to be hopefully getting the most uh, current standards and practices. So they may be put into that, you know, a difficult situation where they're seeing people not doing the most current practice. And people are going to say, well, who the heck are you? Come in here like you know everything. Um, so I think it's really important for them to uh, understand that they may run into something like that. They need to uh, speak to their instruct to their uh, manager in the department and let them know, you know, what they're seeing, um, because, you know, uh, people have to do things right. And it would be very difficult for them to do things one way mm -hmm. while everybody else is doing something else. It's about the worst thing that can happen in a facility. So I see that as a hindrance because I've seen it time and time again where people come out and they do have the most current training and uh, the facility doesn't, and it sometimes can set up a roadblock. So if they're aware of that and prepared for it, it'll make it a little bit easier. Yeah, that is a very delicate situation. And, you know, I've been in that situation, going to a new hospital, seeing something that was wrong and, and not really being in a position to fix it, but having to go tell somebody. Uh, so that is a tough one for a new technician coming in. But I always tell my students, if you see something that's wrong, Go to the manager and, and have backup, have your data, have your, you know, whether it's guidelines, standards, whatever it is, make sure you have the paperwork and say, this is what I'm talking about. And this is where we could have a possible uh, problem. Um, but pointing it out to staff, I know that doesn't go well, especially if you're the new no. kid coming in. Um, so definitely I've seen a lot of problems. Well, I do want to thank you guys, Melinda, Nancy, Mike. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. 
Um, it was a great discussion. I hope it got, uh, people had some good takeaways from it. If you do have questions that we weren't able to get to, there were a lot of questions I did not, I was not able to get to. Uh, so you can connect with Mike, Nancy, or Melinda via email or LinkedIn. And as our day comes to a close, I really would like to say a special thank you uh, to the Certification Board for Sterile Processing and Distribution, CBSPD, for encouraging continued education for sterile processing and flexible endoscope reprocessing professionals, and teaming up with Beyond Clean to bring you our first ever uh, co summer conference series. Stay tuned to Beyond Clean to find details on the registration for part two, which is coming to a mobile device near you on August 27th. And we're gonna be exploring the hottest topics in sterile processing. I would like to again thank today's event sponsor, Agility and Northfield Medical. Without their support, this exciting day of virtual learning would not have been possible. And a special thank you to our industry experts for joining us for this virtual event. So much education today, so many great takeaways, uh, just so many things that I learned from today's sessions. Uh, I'd like to also recognize all the professionals who reprocess surgical instruments and flexible endoscopes across the globe. For all of you who chose to spend your day educating yourself, we want to thank you for your dedication to professional development and best practice. At this session's close, you're going to be directed to the conference survey page where you will have access to the survey. And from there, you can download your CE certificate. If you want to come back to do the survey later, you can visit Beyond Clean Credit Hub anytime. All of today's sessions will be available there on demand, so you can rewatch, you can share them, continue to access all those downloadable resources that were provided to you today. Stay safe out there, sterile processing and endoscopy technicians. As always, keep fighting dirty, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.